Welcome to the You Got Into Wear podcast. I'm your host, Joy Wade, author, college admissions coach, and founder of You Got Into Wear. Every Monday, I bring you actionable interviews with college admissions experts and students who share their insight on college applications, essays, scholarships, financial aid, test prep, and more to help you get admitted into your top choice universities. Let's get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the You Got Into Wear podcast. I am so excited that you are listening to today's episode. If you're a high school student who wants to learn the ins and outs of the college admissions process and eliminate the stress of learning everything on your own, you have to consider getting your free college admissions glossary guide from You Got Into Wear. The College Admissions Glossary is a downloadable PDF that provides over 50 college admissions and financial aid related terms and definitions for students. The college application process is overwhelming and the glossary will eliminate hours of research and confusion while filling out applications for admission, scholarships, and financial aid. You can download the free guide at glossary.yougotintoware.com. That's glossary.yougotintoware.com. Let's get straight into today's episode. I am so delighted to welcome today's guest, Renee Lopez, author of Looking for a Full Ride. On today's episode, we discuss the basics of athletic recruiting, how to build relationships with athletic recruiters, NCAA standards for college admissions, scholarships and full rides for athletes, how to decide which college to attend, and your chances of being recruited and getting athletic scholarships. Renee Lopez, a 17-year-old coaching veteran, has been successful both in business and sports. She has been a college soccer coach for 14 years and high school varsity coach for three years. She served on staff at the University of Florida and also has been an NCAA Division I, II, and NAIA head coach for 11 years. As a coach, Renee developed three All-Americans, was named Coach of the Year, and regularly led her teams to academic honors, sportsmanship awards, and regional championships. Additionally, Renee is the CEO of her own Leadership Development and Coaching Education Academy Consulting Service, and she is the author of an upcoming book on the college recruiting process for student athletes titled Looking for a Full Ride, an Insider's Recruiting Guide, where she has re- she's interviewed 65 college coaches and athletic directors across 19 different sports. On top of all of that, Renee runs a weekly blog on the college recruiting process for high school students, student athletes, eight different Facebook groups related to college coaching, recruiting, mindset, and leadership, And as a recruiting educator, she has even been featured with the National Alliance for Youth Sports, USA Weekly, ESPN Radio, and Sirius XM. You can find more about her at rlopezcoaching.com or email her at info at lookingforafullride.com. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast today, Renee. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. And I know the students who are listening are student athletes. They're so excited to start learning a little bit more about recruiting and kind of just demystify the process. So just to begin, there's so much confusion around the college recruiting process. Um, There's movies that tell us things. There's um, siblings who might have gone off to get recruited. So like what are some common misconceptions that are surrounding this recruiting process? Well, you're absolutely right. There are a lot of misconceptions. And I think, you know, that's one of the things, having been at the D1, D2, NAI level, as well as, you know, being on staff at the University of Florida, you know, one of the big name power five conferences, as well as I've I've worked in small schools. And so I think there's the one misconception that that comes out first and foremost is that everyone thinks that that that, you know, watching a movie like The Blind Side, you know, so many people have watched that movie and they think, oh, this is how the college recruiting process is going to go, where, you know, college coaches are just knocking on your door and they're just looking to, you know, just bending over backwards and and just willing to give you this, that, and the other, anything that you would ask for. And that's just not how the process works for about 95% of the student athletes that are out there. You know, the reality is many of them actually need to get themselves 
um, recruited, and that's that they have to market themselves. They need to be the ones sending out emails to college coaches, letting them know of the interests and that, that college coaches um, should be looking into them as a recruit. Oftentimes, student athletes think that they are going to get recruited just because they're all conference or they're, they're quote unquote, one of the best in their high schools. The thing is that a lot of times uh, coaches don't know of their interests of, of their university, and they may not know about them, especially if they're across the country or even some of the schools, you know, just even down the road, they may not know that this is a good fit for them in terms of the college. And I think it's really important for um, kids to also understand that the idea that they have to rec- get themselves recruited and market themselves to coaches by sending a really proper email to a coach, not using, you know, a bunch of uh, uh, slang and, and, and things that you would text, you know, to um, a college coach. And it has to be a professional email instead in that we are um, helping them through that process to teach them what, what they should be saying in those emails and sending video links and, and how to really get the process started by them starting it with the coaches, not the reverse and expecting college coaches are just going to be knocking on their door. Thanks for clearing a lot of that up. So you're saying they need to, you know, get a jump start on that process. So what year in high school do you recommend like a student get serious about their recruiting? Well, you know, I think it, it varies across different sports. Um, you know, there are some sports that are start the process very, very early, sometimes in the eighth, seventh grades, eighth grade, where they'll start looking at athletes. Now, that's the elite level, um, you know, typically more towards the basketball and football world. But, you know, that's more of just an evaluation time for coaches. They may watch some players. But I think it's really important going into freshman, sophomore years of high school that kids start the funnel of of creating 20 to 40 colleges that they look for that are are, are going to send out emails to that hit the mark. And I always refer to it as the broken leg test that hit the mark of things that are very important to the school uh, for the for the kid that has nothing to do with the actual sport. So thinking in terms of what is a good fit for them academically, you know, what does it look like in terms of their majors, but also the size of the classes that they may be looking at, as well as the location, how far away they want to be from home, but also, you know, what's the social environment that they're looking at. And I think if, if, if a kid can start with maybe 20 to 40 colleges that are within a certain area and a certain, um, you know, area of the country and also, you know, academically, what makes a good fit for them and size of school, they start that during their freshman, sophomore years, and they start to contact coaches and then start to see which coaches are, are quote unquote biting. You know, it's the, we always say the, you know, in fishing, you, you know, are the fish biting? Well, the reality is you want to see if these coaches are biting on you after you send them some video links, maybe you attend one of their camps. But the thing is, is they should start early to start funneling down the, the system into, you know, now going into their junior year, maybe they're down to four or five schools that are a good fit for them academically, athletically, and socially. And then obviously the financial piece comes into it as well, that many parents are always thinking, well, where's that big scholarship come from, you know, from athletics or, you know, is there a combination of athletic and academic scholarships? And and how does that look, look in terms of also with doing their FAFSA, you know, going into their senior year, as well with, you know, grants and loans that may be available too. Thanks for walking us through that. So say I'm a freshman in high school. How do I even grab the contact information for a coach so I can start emailing them? And what am I saying in that email? Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, if you go to almost any website of a college, you can find the coach's email address listed under their staff. And a lot of times they'll say recruiting questionnaire, and you can actually fill out an online recruiting questionnaire. They're basically going to ask you some information about you athletically as well as academically. You know, what are your test scores or, you know, what's your current GPA? as well as what other leadership things are you involved with in your school? You know, are you a captain for your team? Are you also involved in a club program or, you know, outside of your high school, you know, in, in terms of, of playing? But also in that, is there, you have information you can be able to provide to the coach. You know, you may be able to give them some stats about you and your contact information. That's very, very key, their emails and phone numbers. Now, the hard part in all of this is that depending on what level you play at, whether you go to play at the Division I level, Division II, Division III, NAIA, junior colleges, or the National Christian Colleges, or the USA uh, as well, that you can be working in different rules of recruiting. This is where the whole process gets really confusing because depending on what level you are at in terms of your graduation year, if you're a freshman or sophomore versus a junior and senior, 
And depending which level you're looking to play at, they have different rules in terms of the contacts that the coaches can be making for you in contact with you in person versus on the phone versus via email versus they can only speak to your coaches. It depends, again, across different sports as well as different levels. And so you'd have to actually consult the governing body of what level you're looking to play at. And we can go into that. We'd actually be on, on, on this podcast for about four hours if I really fully explained all those rules and regulations. But the thing is, is that kids can always contact the coaches. They can always send an email. They can always give them their contact information. They can always send them a video link of them playing. I always recommend that they upload it to YouTube um, and, and put a password protected on it as well as you can also upload it to huddle, H-U-D-L.com. That's a great uh, resource for you to put that web, uh, your abilities of, you know, that you've recorded some video um, to be able to send to coaches. And then also just tell them a little bit more about you and give them a one page, you know, almost like a, you would for a resume if you're applying for a job. Same idea. You're almost applying for a job uh, situation. So you can, we call them player resumes. Put your contact information, what your, your current ACTs are, or, you know, your test scores of any sort you've even taken before your ACTs or SATs, you know, as well as your GPA, potential majors you want to look into, uh, as well as your athletic abilities. You know, what jersey number do you do you wear? Uh, what school do you play for? What club do you play for? Are you, uh, you know, what positions are you most comfortable with? But the idea is setting those situations up in your initial emails to provide information. Also a key fact is when you send an email to a college coach, especially initially, you do not want to ask for scholarship. It's kind of, I always jokingly say, and you'll appreciate this one, is, you know, I jokingly say is, when you go on a first date with somebody, you don't typically talk about getting married. But the fact of the matter <laughs> right. is, you know, it, when you say to a college coach in your initial email, I really want a scholarship. Well, every college coach knows that every kid wants a scholarship. You know, we know this business. We've been in this business forever. But the fact is, you don't want to say, let's get married to a college coach when they don't really know you. They don't know who you are in terms of your academics, your athletics and also who you are in terms of your character. They're going to want to research your social media. So give them links to your social media. Let them know who you are so they can see what your Twitter handle looks like and things like that, that they can see what you're doing outside of your academics and athletics. Because, you know, as, as we hear all the time in the media that so many kids lose out on scholarship opportunities because they have really dumb things they've posted on social media. They may have pictures that somebody's tagged them in that looks like they're doing something that they're trouble or they're saying bad things about their teammates or saying bad things about their coaches or they're just showing that they're making bad decisions. And so the idea is we want to make sure that the coach starts to get to know you and starts to build a relationship with you. And that's what those initial emails are about. But also tell them what you're interested about their college specifically. What have you done of research about their school? Don't just send out blanket emails to tons and tons of schools that you haven't researched. Tell them that you're interested in their education program. Tell them that you're interested in their business program. Tell them that you love the size of the school and that it's located in a city or, you know, or it's very rural. And, you know, tell them some things that are, that show that you've actually researched the school beyond their athletic programs. And in those initial emails, they're going to find um, that college coaches are going to respond much better back to them if they are specific about the school and that you get the coach's name right. This is like a huge, huge thing. Always say dear coach and their last name. Do not use their first name and do not just say dear and their first name. Because what it is, is it's showing a, a form of disrespect before you even know somebody. You don't know if that coach wants you to be calling them by their first name. You don't know if they want them to be calling um, them just coach or, or what it may look like. But also making sure in the email, you'd be surprised how many times this happens because kids start sending multiple emails at a time that they don't get the right school name in the email, which is crazy to think, wow. but it happens all the time. And it's a major, major thing. It, we want to make sure that your emails lead to a further conversation with these coaches that doesn't allow your, your um, email to get deleted. And n coaches get, you know, hundreds of emails. And, you know, every week, some, some programs, it may just be 100 emails a month, depends on where they're at in terms of abilities. But, you know, you don't want your initial emails to get deleted. You want that to be a great first impression. And so you need to make sure that you're telling them your year of graduation, as well as what position you typically play and giving those video links. But more importantly, help yourself stand out from the hundreds of emails that college coaches are receiving. Wow. So that was really important. It 
a lot of the things you said apply to just the college admissions process in general, making sure you know why you want to go to a specific school. Just because you hear a big name, you need to do a little bit more research to make sure you know exactly what you love about that school. And like you said, that's even more important for your athletic recruiting. So after that initial contact, we've impressed our um, potential new coach with a great email that's specific. Um, what should I be doing outside of my contacts with my coach to make sure that everything on my front is looking great? Like you said, social media, but like what else should I be doing to brand myself, to market myself to these coaches? Absolutely. I think, you know, it, like we mentioned, social media is huge. Um, the, there's so many coaches. After having interviewed 65 college coaches and athletic directors, so many of them said to me, it was amazing across, again, 19 different sports. We interviewed small schools and large schools. And, you know, we have uh, some of the Power Five conference schools as well as schools you've probably never heard of. And purposely, we've done that. The number of coaches and athletic directors said to me that um, so many kids don't even realize that they lost an opportunity because college coaches are typically looking at that social media prior to actually even contacting a, a, an athlete back. And so they don't even realize that they just might not hear back from a coach. It may have been something that they put on, posted on social media that a college coach looked at and said, we don't want that in our program. So the, the, I cannot stress um, enough about how big and important social media is. Now, the other side of it too, is making sure that you're sending coaches up, updated schedules in terms, of, especially if you're playing outside of um, you know, high school, you know, are you playing for a club system, an AAU program? A lot of the sports like volleyball and softball and, and baseball and basketball, um, soccer, field hockey, lacrosse, swimming, multiple of those sports typically have kids that are playing outside of their high school um, seasons. And making sure that college coaches know that and give them the schedules, tell them exactly where you're going to be. You know, maybe they can come out to it. Don't expect that they're going to come out to your high school games. They're looking to be in environments where they can see hundreds of kids. So here, for an example, um, you know, I could fly to watch a, a high school game, um, you know, halfway across the country. Maybe I watch, you know, if I'm coach, watching soccer, you know, there's 22 players playing at one high school game at a time versus I go to a college showcase that may be going through the college, you know, uh, program where um, I could literally be watching games from eight o'clock in the morning until 10, 11 o'clock at night, watching 20 different fields that are available to us. And so we can literally see hundreds of kids over one weekend. And those college showcases become very, very important, as well as some of these camps that can allow recruiting to also be um, for college coaches to watch them and see them play as opposed to it's the more bang for your buck in terms of, of, you know, how do you use your recruiting budget as a coach? And so, you know, there may be some opportunities to be able for you to guest play if you're not playing in one of these teams. Um, but especially in some of those sports I mentioned, um, being able to get seen at college showcases is very, very key, as well as going to their ID camps. Now, just because you get a, a camp invite does not necessarily mean that the college coach is recruiting you. I think that's very important for, for athletes to know. You, you start to register on some of these sites and you're going to start to see that you'll get a lot of invites to camps. Again, look at schools that are, um, that are going to help you with the broken leg test. They're going to be, um, if you break your leg, is it still the right school for you? And, you know, those are the types of schools you should be going to some of their ID camps. A lot of schools are having a one day camp where you can just go and, uh, you know, it, in a nutshell, it's kind of like a tryout, but it's not allowed. It's not titled a tryout. You pay to come to the camp and your travel expenses are covered by yourself, not by the coaches. And you can be around the coaches and some of their team, as well as some other prospects that are looking at the school. And I think these are very good ways for you to get seen by college coaches um, and let the coach know that you're interested. Now, I don't think you need to go to 20 different camps. I think you go to a few camps that you're very interested in the school and, and see where the college coaches um, interest level becomes, you know, I think that's important that a lot of kids start to put all their eggs in one basket and they want to go to these division one schools and they think they're going to play division one. Well, what if they don't, you know, and what if coaches aren't quote unquote biting on you as a division one athlete? So I think it's important to start out the process. Like I said, start out with 20 to 40 schools where some of them are division one schools, division two schools, NAI schools, division three schools, junior colleges, you know, what it may be that they find opportunities to be able to explore. So it's very important that kids see a 10,000 foot view as opposed to looking at the two or three schools. Um, you know, I think that's a big misconception that kids have is, oh, I'll just apply to a couple schools, just send out two or three emails to coaches. And if those three, two or three schools don't bite on me, then I just won't play. 
and they're losing out on opportunities and especially losing out on opportunities for athletic scholarship that may be available for them. Would you be able to kind of lightly touch upon how what is added on top of your college application process when you're trying to um, pursue athletics in college? Um, just for students who are thinking, oh, I just have to do the Common App and I'll be good. Like, there's <laughs> way more than that, oh, of course. We could have a whole other podcast on how much paperwork there is to be doing as a student athlete. Right. But let me, let me identify um, one area that is very, very important. If you are going to intend to play at the Division One or Division Two level, or play at the NAI level, you need to make sure that you register with the eligibility center for those governing bodies. There is one for the NAI as well as for the NCAA. And those governing bodies have the eligibility center, which is completely separate from applying to a college. You're actually getting approval to be eligible to play. And those colleges rely on that as their, uh, you know, it used to be called the clearinghouse. It's no longer called that anymore. But that eligibility center is actually um, the, the stop that needs to happen in order to be cleared to be able to play at that level. So what you have to do is send out your, your ACT, your SAT scores to the eligibility centers. You also need to uh, have your transcripts sent to them directly. And you're just going to register online. It doesn't take very long. Let your uh, academic school counselor also know that you're planning on playing in college so that they can be aware that you're taking the right core courses to make sure you are on track to being eligible. Believe it or not, student athletes believe that, oh, if I've got a really good GPA, I'm automatically eligible to play in college. And that isn't always the case. And so they need to register for the eligibility center. They're going to receive an ID number from the eligibility centers. NAI and the NCAA are two separate entities. And that they are going to have those eligibility center numbers. They can actually send those to the college coaches. They can start to track and, and look and see where they're at in the process and it allows them to start the process earlier. Many kids think, oh, I'll just do that my senior year. And I, I highly recommend that kids start this. They can even start their freshman year of high school. They can just register and just put their information in there. And then as the, the process goes on in the next couple of years, they're going to answer some questions about amateurism. Did they ever get paid to play in sports You know, and things like that? The idea is to make sure that they start this process very early and make sure that they're on track instead of waiting to their senior year. You know, I had an awful situation that happened one time with a kid that she was over a 4.0 GPA and she thought, well, of course I'm on track to be eligible. Why wouldn't I be? Well, she was so high academically that she ended up skipping over a course in math that she didn't realize she still needed to be eligible even though she was still going to graduate from our high school, well, she ended up having to take summer classes. This 4.0 kid had to take summer classes to make sure she was eligible to play in the fall. So it was crazy. It was this crazy situation, and we never would have expected it. But the fact is we want to make sure the academic counselors are on, on board and knowing where they're at in terms of the courses that they're taking to make sure they're not just graduating but also being eligible to play at that NCAA or NAI level. In addition, you know, you mentioned a little bit what other paperwork is there. There's lots of medical paperwork that you have to do as well along the way. But making sure that you're applying to the school and making sure that the college coach knows that you're applying to the school and then, you know, copying them on every correspondence you're having with admissions so that they know – Hey, I've sent my application in, you know, I've sent my transcripts and test scores in and anything else. You know, some schools use the common app. Some of them don't. Um, you know, where is a financial aid? How does that work? You know, every school is different in how they manage that. And some schools may require an interview. Some schools may require letters of recommendation. Every college is different in this, but making sure that they um, that you're keeping the college coach advised as well. If you're you know, if these are one of your top three to five schools, it's very important that the college coach knows that, especially if that college coach is interested in you and, and you know, and being in their program in the future. Okay, so that was really, really useful because I feel like some schools are really on their students about making sure that they know every aspect of the admissions process, what's going to come for them. And then others, some schools, some programs, they kind of leave it up to their students to figure it out. So if you are in the second situation, um, just make sure you are doing your research um, and really figuring out what has to get done because you don't want to be put in a situation after the fact where you have to go back, um, take summer classes <laughs> like um, your one student um, and things like that. I wanted to transition the conversation into 
the probably the most common question you get um, is like, will I get a full scholarship? Am I going to get a scholarship? Where's the money? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'm not even going to ask the question. I'm just going to let you probably have a little rant. About yes, that. Um, you know, it is the question coaches are always being asked. And, you know, like I said, there's a time and a place for it. You got to think about the process. Don't be asking it initially when you start first talking to a coach. Um, because it just really turns a coach off because it, so then a coach sees it as the only reason you're looking at our school is because of money, as opposed to that you're balancing out all the factors that are involved in, in choosing a school. And so let's break down a little bit of division one, division two, and, and how that works a little bit differently um, and NAI and, and things like that. So first of all, it's important to know that division one and division two can offer full ride scholarships. That does not mean that every kid you hear about that goes off to college to play at Division I or Division II is on a full-ride scholarship. There are many kids that are walk-ons, meaning they don't receive any athletic scholarship. There are also kids that may be receiving partial scholarships. I'm going to try and make this as easy as I can, but it is quite complicated. So I'm going to try and tackle this and, and, and try and keep it as basic as I can. So um, if there's any questions after this, please feel free to reach out to me for sure. In the NCAA Division I and Division II, there are equivalency sports and then there are headcount sports. Headcount sports mean that there are a certain number of athletes that can receive scholarships on their team. This is typically what you see in football and in basketball. And then opposed to equivalency sports. Equivalency means that there is a certain amount of scholarships available of equivalencies across the entire team. So let's give an example here. In Division I women's soccer, you can have 14 uh, equivalency scholarships. So what does that mean? That means that if a coach wanted to, they could put 14 kids on a full ride if they wanted to end their program. Well, most college women's soccer programs for Division I, they typically have a roster of about 30 just because of they need in terms of, you know, be able to, to uh, injuries and things like that and, and also to be able to, to last a season. So if they put 14 scholarships on 14 kids on full rides in that equivalency level, that means there are nothing left for those other 16, you know, typical athletes. As opposed to what if they put 28 kids on partial scholarships? Maybe that means two other players are, are walk-ons or, you know, or something like that. But the thing is, is that means that they are offering partial scholarships to athletes. And so many sports are actually equivalency sports. Again, you can look this up on NCAA if your sport is an equivalency sport or a headcount sport. It's very important for you to know that difference. Um, and that knowing that not all kids are going on a full ride scholarship at the division one or division two level. That being said, not all sports are fully funded at each university. Okay. So if you look at, again, take this division one women's soccer idea, that's 14 full ride scholarships for women's soccer division one at the division two level. If a program is fully funded, it is only 9.9 full scholarships that are equivalency across the team to be used. And on the men's side, that would only be nine scholarships as opposed to women's would be 9.9. .9. And so you start to look at that and it, it varies across all different sports and we could go on forever about what that would look like in different sports. But the fact is many kids expect that every kid is on a full ride scholarship if they're playing in college. And that's simply not true. Typically, when you look at high school student athletes, the conversion of how many of them actually go on to play, depending on the sport, is anywhere from 3 to 10 to maybe 12% of kids actually go on to play in college. That is not even the percentages of how many of them are on full-ride scholarships or even on scholarships. So receiving an athletic scholarship is rare. It is not something that should be expected knowing what those statistics are. And again, you can consult all those statistics across the board on the NCAA website, as well as the NAI and junior college websites. You'll see a little bit what that information looks like. So if scholarship money is really, really important for you to look at in terms of um, balancing out how do you pay for college, what often happens in some programs, and this is a great question to ask to um, any coaches that you're speaking with, or even financial aid, as well as admissions, is does the school allow stacking of scholarships? Meaning 
Can you stack athletic scholarships on top of academic scholarships or any other financial aid? The answer is some schools say, will say yes and some schools will say no. It may be a certain amount. Maybe you get only $10,000 of athletic money. Maybe they'll allow you to stack you know, $10,000 of, of academic scholarship. That could be different at every school. Now, the big key important part of this is understanding that Division I, Division II, NAI, and junior college schools can offer scholarships for athletics. Division three programs cannot offer athletic scholarship programs, but don't dismiss that in terms of the opportunities to be able to play at the division three level. A lot of schools will have opportunities to be able to get other academic scholarships and maybe it's a leadership scholarship or other things that could be available to you that may not be specifically to athletics, but understanding that if you are looking for you know, the best way to be able to fund your college, it may not be at the division one level or division two level. You may want to be researching NAI schools and junior college schools because a lot of scholarships are available at those levels. And, you know, again, if you're only playing for two years at a junior college, you may be able to transfer to a division one or division two school afterwards or an NAI school and find that better fit in terms of finances as well as academics and, and athletic and social fit overall. Wow, that's a mouthful. But thank you for going in depth on that and breaking it down, because that is one part that I always personally got confused about. And I think that's going to be very beneficial to um, those who are listening. So I wanted to kind of talk about students who maybe don't know whether they're good or not. They don't know if they're going to get rejected. Like, what are some things that students should have maybe as a backup plan in case they don't. Well, I get- think it's really important that, like I said, don't put all your eggs in one basket as in terms of a level. Do not expect you're going to go play division one just because you're an all conference player or you're the best on your team in your high school. You have to remember that college coaches can choose from literally any student athlete across the entire United States but also internationally. And more and more schools are looking internationally to recruit athletes. And so, you know, not putting all your eggs in in one basket, you know, as college coaches, we always joke, it's a phrase that you may hear college coaches say, it's, we call, they got D1 on the brain, meaning that their only thought process is that I'm going to play division one. And so I think it's really important that kids start the process early, see what types of college coaches are biting, you know, at interest level uh, for them as well, you know, and, and looking at different levels across the board that don't throw all their eggs into the division one basket. And, you know, so many opportunities are out there and so many competitive opportunities. You know, one of my friends, uh, close friends is um, the uh, head women's uh, lacrosse coach at Florida Southern University here in Lakeland, Florida, where I live and her and I are, are good friends. And, you know, She'll jokingly say, you know, she won a national championship and her kids have competed for national championships. They've lost in the championship and they've also won a championship. And, you know, for national championship, you look and you say, that's a Division II school. But the fact of the matter is, those kids are are competing at a very high level, but it's not Division I. But they're getting a great academic, you know, uh, opportunity to be able to play in a beautiful campus. And you look at some of those schools and say, you know, uh, Coach Reber will say to you, you know, my kids are competing for a championship, you know, the past few years. They don't even think twice that it's not Division Pro, Division One program. And so I think it's important for us to be able to really look at these schools and, and evaluate what opportunities that could be there and eval- evaluate what opportunities you may have. And so I think the biggest mis- mistake that, that kids make in this process is they don't start early enough and keeping it broad enough and looking at those 20 to 40 schools, like I mentioned, and not just looking at Division One, but looking at the bigger picture because you may get rejected. You may not have opportunities. And if you throw all your eggs in one basket, you're just not going to always have see what else is out there. So, you know, I also encourage kids to to look at programs, you know, even if they don't find a college athletic program to play for, that you may have opportunities to play in murals or, you know, some schools have club programs as well, depending on the sport. Um, but you could look to try and see to walk on to a program once you get there. I don't recommend that because oftentimes that doesn't work out. But I think it's important to just keep your your base very broad in terms of the schools that you're you're talking with and, and contacting. Um, but if 
you don't get those division one bites, you know, looking at other schools and other levels to see if you can still play and still receive some athletic scholarship or just get a roster spot to be able to play. Um, because I think what you'll find is being a college athlete is an amazing experience and it is also great for being, uh, you know, uh, employers are looking for people that have been college athletes because they know that you've had to have a, a very good time management skills and, and you also know how to work on a team and, you know, to be able to be a productive member of society uh, and in their corporations and, and, you know, whether you're a nurse or you're, you're in the business world or teaching, it doesn't matter. Um, employers are looking for you to be a team player. And I think it is, makes you even more marketable when you graduate having been a college athlete as well. Great. And for students who may be on the other end of the spectrum and they go through the recruiting process and have multiple offers, how, what type of advice do you have for well, them? Well, you know, on I run blogs right? on my website and you know, I have tons of them on there. And I actually re- did a three part series um, before you commit, um, during committing, and then, you know, after signing, what are some of the things you should be doing? And what you shouldn't be doing, um, you know, don't commit to a school until you really are hundred percent knowing it's a good fit. Always ask the coach, you know, where do you see me in your program? Ask them what their recruiting class looks like. Ask them some things, you know, and ask them the hard questions before you make the decision. You know, balance out, don't just balance out the athletic offers, but balance out the overall program. Make sure you have visited campus. You know, there's a lot of kids that don't visit a campus and they only judge a school by how much scholarship offer uh, they, they were offered. And I think that's a it's a big problem, you know, because they need to make sure that they've seen the campus. They know what their dorms are like. They know um, sitting on a class, they know what it looks like academically, what their academic programs will look like. They've met their potential new teammates and what that would look like. Visit the athletic training room, you know, see uh, what the library is like and what opportunities they're going to offer for you in terms of internships and, you know, and, and also get to know the coaching staff as well as, you know, uh, your professors that you're going to be having in the program you'd be, you'd be a part of academically. But more importantly, they need to also get a feel for the social fit of the school and making sure that they understand, you know, is it living in a city? Is it someplace you can't even think about having a car as a freshman? Or, you know, what's it like to, you know, where's the mall and where's the movie theaters and what is living in this area really like? And I think a lot of kids forget that those pieces are really important um, in deciding what a program looks like just beyond the athletics. So on my website, I also have a, a blog that talks about 13 questions you can ask a college coach and things that you want to be asking along the way um, before you make any decisions. Obviously, you want to make sure that we are um, in a situation that we are uh, knowing more about the program beyond just the X's and O's, but knowing, you know, what community service programs are, you know, the, the student athletes involved in, what are they doing outside of, um, academics and athletics? You know, are they involved in other, you know, clubs on campus? You know, do they have time to be an RA? I think just asking all of those types of questions in order to understand what their whole uh, life will be like for four years, because if you understand what it's going to be like, there's not going to be, every day is going to be perfect and peachy keen, but understanding, you know, that, that you are choosing a school that that is going to be your home for the next four years and so that we don't um, just choose it just based off of um, athletics. I think that's a really key part, but also balancing out, you know, where are those offers looking like that you feel like you're going to be able an opportunity to play, you know, ask the coach what that looks like. Don't necessarily say, am I going to start, but ask them, you know, how can I contribute? But also the flip side of it, you know, are you going to be the kid at the end of the bench who may not ever see any playing time? And I think that's the thing is, you know, I could have probably gone and played at a, at a big division one school, um, you know, and, and played in college. Um, but I probably would have been at the end of the bench almost every game and, and not really playing. But instead, you know, I chose to uh, play at a smaller school and I started every game as a freshman. And so, you know, balancing out that and what that may look like, you know, and, and how do you balance out what your overall uh, happiness is going to be over four years and not just the athletic portion of it, and not just the financial side of it, but really the the bigger picture. And I call that the broken leg test. I love that term. Okay. Um, so 
I just wanted to get our students thinking about the future. So I know this is going to vary depending on the type of school they go to, but what should they expect once they sign the papers and are starting as a student athlete as far as commitment, as far as balancing <laughs> school and life? Like, could you just name a few, <laughs> name maybe like two or three points of expectations? Absolutely. Well, I, I think first course. and foremost, now you've gone from maybe you were the, um, uh, big fish in a little pond, you are now going to be a tiny little fish in a big pond. And, you know, the idea is you're starting the process over again. You are a freshman and you need to work harder than you ever have before. Don't expect just because you were the star when you were a high school student athlete, uh, that now you're all automatically not going to have to do anything more. I, honestly, I think that's probably the big thing that college coaches are looking for is that they're looking for kids that are going to continue to work and continue to improve and that you're looking to get 1% better every day. I always use the term Kaizen. It's a, 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 a term that's a Japanese business term of continuous improvement. Mental training coach that worked with my teams for years, Tammy Matheny, um, actually introduced me to this term. It's the idea of Are you a kid who is going to continue to work and get better each and every day, not just be content with where you are at because you received all these awards in high school, but knowing now we want you to step up to a whole other level that playing in college is is just a whole different level of playing and commitment in terms of your time, like you mentioned, balancing out school as well as, you know, having a little bit of a social life and, you know, hanging out in the dorms and, and such like that. But I think it's important that also kids realize that they're the college coaches are really looking for kids that can have resilience, meaning that they have grit, that they're looking to um, be able to bounce back from adversity. And college coaches are looking at observing that when they are looking at you as an athlete on the field or on the court or in the pool, wherever it may be. They're looking at when you have a mistake or adversity hits, how do you bounce back? Because they want to see how you're going to do that when you come to college. Because it is not an easy transition. You're getting to know a new environment. You're getting to know new friends. You're, you're playing for a new coach, um, as well as you're balancing out school. It's not easy in the process, but um, they're looking for those high academic kids who can balance all those things and and in their schoolwork and you know the maturity to also not be skipping class, not be doing stupid things on social media, um, but representing the university well. And I think those are really key important parts um, to balancing it out. If you start to look to play in college, um, you know, if you're going to go play, you very important, you speak with your weight training coaches and conditioning coaches. Um, and you, uh, bust your butt, you know, the, uh, the summer before you go off to play as well as you're investing in terms of developing yourself as a leader and mentally as well. And that probably includes reading a bunch of books and maybe watching some movies that college coaches want you to do. And, and just realize it is um, we're, college coaches are looking for 24 seven athletes, meaning they're looking for athletes who are taking care of their bodies, you know, getting rest when they need to getting recovery when they need to and eating properly. And so they're looking for the habits overall. And I think that's the key that, that you can show a college coach early on in the recruiting process, you know, that that's what you are and that's what you do. And you have the maturity to be able to handle a whole different level of playing in college. And one last question I have about when students get to college, should they let their um, athletics affect which major they choose? Um, Here at USC, um, it seems like a lot of athletes are pigeonholed into so-called easier majors so that they can balance their athletics. But what types of things you suggest for students who are really passionate about like a certain field or field of study and they want to make sure no, that that's they a can great also question. I think there's athletes. a lot of uh, student athletes that get so caught up in choosing a college by name first and with the, especially in the athletic world. And I think we got to make sure we go back to that broken leg test and making sure you're asking the questions. You know, there's some times that you will find, you know, a, a typical championship season, you know, for softball or baseball at, and, and the college level is, in the spring. And if you're student teaching, you know, your, your last semester of your senior year, or maybe you have nursing clinicals, or maybe you have to do an internship for a business major, whatever it may be, you know, the fact is they may not be able to play all four years. And, you know, that's where I think this comes on the front end in looking at colleges and how can you balance those things out? I hate seeing kids get pigeonholed into majors that really aren't going to be productive for what they want to do and their passions for the rest of their life. You know, 
uh, going to college to play is awesome and that's great. But the fact is you're there for an education. You, the term student athlete is what we use because you are a student first and making sure that you choose the right school for you. That's going to push you towards your academic goals and career goals first and foremost. And you know, most kids don't go on to play professionally afterwards. You know, there may be about, you know, some sports, it's half a percent. Some of the sports is 1% of kids that play in college will actually go off to play and continue professionally. So you have to prepare yourself for the next 10, 20, 30 years, as opposed to, you know, just choosing a school based off of, you know, what the athletic program may be able to offer you. And so I think that's really important. It's a great question. And, and I, I highly encourage kids to think about that prior to starting the process as opposed to, oh gosh, we found this school we like and it's good athletically, but does it really fit for me academically and socially? Thanks for saying that. This podcast interview has been amazing and I wanted to give you the chance to tell our listeners about some the two amazing opportunities you have for them in regards to um, your Absolutely. free report you and know, your so consulting. I do, uh, do consulting work with a lot of high school student athletes and just walking them through the process. I educate you on the process. I, I teach you what to do. I don't do it for you. I think this is really important. You will hear of recruiting services that are out there. I do not encourage you to um, hire a recruiting service. You can do all the right things just by following the things that I have on my blogs that are all for free. Um, if you I uh, also want to join some of my free Facebook groups that I run. Please feel free to check those out on my website. It's rlopezcoaching.com. You can find a lot of my free blogs as well as the links to those Facebook groups, as well as you can find my special report. If you go to lookingforafullride.com, you can get a copy of our special report, Strategies to Emailing a College Coach, where I spell it all out for you, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. And you can also get information about when our upcoming book comes out here later this year and give you information about what that may look like. I also wanted to reach out. Those are all free uh, reports, like I mentioned for you, Facebook groups, as well as the special report and the blogs. And then also, if you would like to um, have me do some consulting work with you and your parents um, to be able to sit down with you, I will offer out, if you mentioned that you were on this podcast, I will offer out to you a $50 discount um, to signing just three consulting sessions with me. That's typically what I start with. And then we kind of walk through where you need to go from there. And a lot of, a lot of kids basically kind of work with me for about three sessions and then they're right on track and then, you know, may come back to me a year or two later and say, hey, let, now we're at the point we're getting offers. Now we want to make some decisions. And uh, we walk through that. So if you mention this podcast, I will give you a $50 uh, coupon and you can just shoot me an email at info at lookingforafullride.com, info at lookingforafullride.com and mention this podcast that you heard me here. Also, for anyone who may be a coach or maybe an athletic director or a teacher or a school counselor, I do also do recruiting seminars live in person as well as webinars in, for groups of organizations. So if you'd like for me to come in and I typically do a 90 minutes to two hour sessions where I spell out everything we just touched on today and really walk through that process, I will also offer out a discount for you. Again, just mention this podcast and we will um, give you a, a discount as well. So thank you so much for having me today. Just one last comment for um, people who might be listening after the podcast is out. Do you guys have a release month uh, we for hope the to book? We hope to be finishing up uh, late 2018 or early 2019. So again, if you go onto our website, lookingforafullride.com, and you sign up for our email list, you'll be able to find out exactly when we release it, as well as you can follow me on social media, our Facebook uh, business page, as well as Looking for a Full Ride. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. This was so valuable. And Absolutely. I hope Thank you so much. a lot of students anything reach out I can to you. do just help clearing up the process. Feel free to reach out to me at info at looking for a full ride.com. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. If you found value in this podcast, make sure you share it with a friend and leave a review because reviews will help this podcast be discovered by other students and families that are looking to get into college. If you're interested in finding the show notes with links and free resources, go to yougotintoware.com slash podcast.